Hello everyone. Today we would be presenting our ECN 676 project that is simulating superscalar processor on GEMFI and CHAMSIM simulator and predicting the IPC using MLR. This project is uh, the team members are Tapajyoti Mandal, Dheeraj Kurwa and Sanket Agarwal. The project is divided into three parts. The first part is where we would be designing the superscalar processor using GEMFI simulator and analyzing the results. In the second part, the superscalar processor would be analyzed using CHAMSIM simulator. And in the third part, we would be developing a predictor model using multiple linear regression. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Tapojyoti Mandal and I'll be walking you over the section of our project in which we modeled the superscalar processor in GEM5 and then used PASIC benchmarks to analyze its performance. So the way GEM5 works is like it uses simulation objects to instantiate the different uh, modules or the different sections that are part of a out of order processor. So this is the abstract diagram of how a processor is modeled. So if you observe this CPU derived O3 CPU is basically a class in Gem5 which uses, which has all of the components of an out of, out of order processor. And then we have our instruction and data caches, which is the L1 level caches. And we also have our L2 level cache. So basically this is a out of order processor with two level cache hierarchy. And we have our L2 crossbar and system crossbar through which our L2 caches, our CPU, and then our DRAM are connected with each other. Apart from this, you can observe that we have our uh, TLBs and interrupt objects as well. These are something which are part of, uh, of the x86 ISC and are added by default. In this slide, we have the x86 ISA that GEM5 roughly simulates. This is the NetBurst microarchitecture, and GEM5 pretty much simulates in this form of a model. So we have the fetch stage where the instructions are fetched, the decode stage where we have the decoding of all of the instructions. Then these instructions are fed into a buffer in GEM5, and that buffer is used by the allocator and the register renamer stage, which renames all of the uh, dependencies between the uh, architectural and physical register files. The instructions are then classified into memory instructions, which are our load and store instructions, and our integer, floating point, and branch instructions, which are then fed into different ALU units, which is configurable in GEM5. Once the issue, execute, and write back is finished, it is feed it into the ROB, the reorder buffer, and then the reorder buffer commits when all of the instructions are, have finished their execution. We have used four benchmarks from the Parsec benchmark suite for simulating with our out-of-order model. Black Skulls, Canyon, Fragmine, and Stream Cluster. These benchmarks have a good distribution of integer, floating point, and read-write instructions, and hence we selected these. Now, the GEM5 simulation, our model has a certain number of parameters which we can vary. We have selected five primary parameters, which are fetch width, decode width, rename width, issue width, dispatch width, and commit width belonging to one category. These basically go on to decide our window size. Then we have second and third parameters, which are basically the depth of the load queue and the store queue. And the fourth parameter is our instruction queue depth, the buffer which holds all of the instructions from the decode stage. And then the final parameter is the ROB entry size. Apart from that, we have also varied our functional unit configuration. In our functional units, we have our integer ALU, integer multiply division, floating point ALU, floating point multiply division, and load and store units, which do the load and store address calculation. All of these parameters have been varied for each of these benchmarks, and we have generated around 1,200 set of um, results, which are being used to train our model. We varied the functional unit configuration for our out of order CPU model and observed a couple of interesting behaviors. The integer ALU and integer multiply division units, the impact of it is only visible if the window size is greater than or equal to seven. 
For lower window sizes, the number of instructions that are being feeded into the execution units in the IEW stage is not sufficient to take advantage of the varying number of integer ADU and integer multiply units. And by varying the units from around 2 to 5, we observe a speed up in IPC of around 1.3. For FRACMINE benchmark and other benchmarks, we observed that changing the floating point units didn't change the IPC much. This was something which was expected in FRACMINE because the number of instructions that uh, FRACMINE has in terms of floating points is none, almost close to none, but other instructions also didn't observe any speed up, which is kind of peculiar and we couldn't understand the reason for that. The load and store units didn't provide any improvement at all. The reason for that uh, after our analysis seems that although the load and store instructions um, have increased number of available units for its address calculation, the dependency between them, that is the true dependencies, and the cache miss, miss rates play a major role in them not providing significant benefits. Here is a graphical representation for one of the benchmarks, which is FRACMINE. We can clearly observe that the load and store queue entries provide very minimal speed up, and sometimes it doesn't even provide any. And the ma majority of the speed up is observed by changing the window size. By changing the window size from 4 to 8, we observe a speed up from around 1, 1, 1. 5, 1, 5 to 1.2. And the impact of ROB entries is more prominent when the window size is around 7 to 8. I am Neeraj Kurva, and I would be guiding you to the working of ChampSim Simulator and the results derived from the ChampSim Simulator using the SPEC CPU 2017 benchmark. So the ChampSim is a trace based simulator, which means that it is performed by looking at the traces of the program execution or the system component access with the purpose of performance prediction. A general trace based simulator have two components. One part that executes the instruction and stores the result, that is the traces, and other which reads the log files of the traces and interpolates it to the new scenarios. In our model, we would be running 200 million instructions as warm-up instructions and later 1 billion instructions for the detailed simulation. We have chosen perceptron-based branch predictor as the default configuration because it performs better than the bimodal and the G-share branch predictors. The configuration of the default is as shown. We have chosen the L1 and L2C prefetcher as none and the LLC replacement policy as LRU. In our case, we would be varying the instruction fetch width, decode width, execution width, and ROB buffer to create different configurations. And on these configurations, we would be running the SPEC 2017 benchmarks. In our project, we would be using SPEC 2017 benchmarks for the ChampSim simulator. The SPEC stands for Standard Performance Evaluation Corporation. The SPEC CPU 2017 benchmark focuses on compute intensive performance, which means it uses the application that demands a lot of computation, such as meteorology programs and other scientific applications. These benchmarks emphasize the performance of the processor, the memory, as well as the compiler. As the plotted graph suggests, the IPC for the Imagic is the highest and for that of the Omnitape benchmark is the lowest. Hence, we have chosen these two benchmarks to get an overall estimate. The Imagic benchmark is a floating point and focused more on image processing, whereas the Omnitape is an integer point benchmark and it is focused on the discrete event simulation in the communication networks. During execution, it was found that the Imagic benchmark takes approximately 35 minutes to complete its execution on a single configuration, whereas the Omnitap takes approximately 50 minutes to complete its execution. Here, we are changing the parameters that have a major impact on the IPC and other performance deciding parameters. We choose the instruction fetch, decode, and execute width as a single parameter. That is, all the three parameters are increased simultaneously as it was observed that the three parameters are very closely related to each other. When fetch width is increased, the decode and execute must also increase in a similar manner to see any improvement on the IPC. 
if the fetch width is greater than the decode width, the decode width will act as a bottleneck and there would not be any considerable impact even if fetch width is increased. The next parameter that is being changed is the retire width. This increase enables us to commit or retire more number of instructions that have finished execution. The order buffer allows more number of instructions to be in flight and this helps in performing the out of order execution. Here we have the graphical representation for the 638 imaging benchmark. In the first graph, we have we read the instruction fetch width. And it can be seen that as we increase the instruction fetch width for different configurations, there is a linear increase in the IPC. In the second graph, we have increased the retire width in a similar manner as that of instruction fetch width and the result obtained is also similar. It increases slowly and it can be seen that the increase is much greater in terms of retire width than it was for instruction fetch width. In the third graph, we have increased the reorder buffer size from 64 to 512. However, in this case, the relative instruction is not of that big amplitude as it was for instruction fetch width. The reason for this being that the initial configuration of 64 width ROB was sufficient enough for all the instructions to perform out of order execution. Hence, when we increase from 64 to 512, the increase is not significant. This slide highlights the result simulation results of 620 Omnic PP benchmark. The output result is similar as that in the previous benchmark image. The instruction fetch width increases linearly. Similarly, the retire width also increases linearly, which results in increase in the IPC. And the ROB also show some amount of increase in the IPC, but that is not that significant when, as compared to the instruction fetch width and retire width. Hello everyone, my name is Sanket Agarwal and I'll be walking you through the predictor model that we have used, that we have built using multiple linear regression. So as seen from the above slides, we varied different parameters and observed the effect on IPC. That is, how IPC varied with changes in certain key input variables. While the simulated IPC might be true, it takes almost five to eight hours in simulating any configuration. Thus, in order to reduce this effort, we aimed at building a predictor model using multiple linear regression technique. MLR works on least squares methods as its estimation method, which helps in answering the relationship between two variables. In addition, it also gives results that indicate how dominant is any input in determining the output. This will be seen from results that follow the slides later. Let us walk through more about the multiple linear regression model. The general equation over here represents the mathematical equation of the MLR model where Y represents the output variable known as target. Here X1, X2, X3 up till XP represents the input independent features to predict a target. With the help of a given data set, we calculate the values of betas, which is beta 1, beta 2 up to beta P, which in turn decides the accuracy of the model. Beta 1 is the coefficient of feature 1, beta 2 is the coefficient of feature 2, and so on. Briefly speaking, these coefficients are calculated by multiplying the correlation value to the ratio of the mean deviation of y and x. Beta 0 is a special term known as the intercept term. For our model, this represents the IPC when we select the basic configuration. As seen from the graph over here, Predicted values can be above or below the predicted straight line, which is the blue line in the graph. Thus, errors EI are always squared and accuracy is calculated on the squared error. Now, let us walk through the results of the MLR module that we got after training the data set from the four benchmarks of GEMPHI and two of the JAMSIM model. Using a cell script, we extracted and segregated data IPC data from 7,746 data set points. Using this data set, the above result of the 
Above result was generated when data set or stream cluster was used to train the predictor model, whereas the bottom one represents the canyon predictor model. Looking at the stream cluster model, the first line represents the IPC output Y and the coefficient values of different input parameters along with the intercept term. Since our base machine had a configuration of IF4, LQ16, SQ16, IQ32, and ROB64, it generated the intercept of 0.6815. The model was trained to predict values that have higher configuration than these. It can be seen from the coefficient values of the model. The IPC depends more on the instruction fetch window and the ROB window and less on the IQ, SQ and LQ. This matches with the explanation provided before. However, in certain benchmarks such as the Canyon benchmarks show lesser dependency on the increase in the ROB beyond 64. Thus, for Canyon benchmarks, the number of ROB window beyond 64 does not affect much. It depends more on the cache size and the hit miss rate of it. So how accurate is this model? This can be answered by looking at the R squared value which is pretty good in both the cases and the cases which follow next. It explains basically the R squared value explains the proportion of variability in the target that can be explained using an input feature. Therefore, if a feature X can predict the target, then the proportion is high and the R square value will be close to 1. Moving on to the other benchmarks that we simulated, we have results of Black Scholes and Frequent benchmarks of GEM5 and Imagic and Omnetab benchmarks of the ChamSim model. The GEM5, uh, mod, the GEM5 benchmarks, Black Scholes and Frequent are over here at the bottom and this uh, on, on the top we have the Omnetab and the uh, Imagic, mod, Imagic benchmark. While individual coefficients indicate the relevancy of individual in input parameters, we have the F statistics parameter that indicates the overall statistical significance of input variables. It basically indicates if the output is dependent on input or not. If there is a strong relationship, then F will be much larger than 1, otherwise it will be approximately equal to 1. As you can see over here, we have a quite high F statistic value for all our results. For large data sets, a value slightly larger than 1 would indicate a strong relationship since we had a smaller data set, we get a large value enough to indicate that IPC has a strong relationship with the input variables chosen. From GEM5 results, we concluded that varying LQ, SQ and IQ does not affect much. Thus, we varied only the IF, ROB and RW for the ChamSim model as it can be seen over here. And observed a similar result with one integer benchmark and one floating point benchmark. So basically, uh, Imagic is our floating point benchmark and Omnetap is the uh, integer benchmark. As expected, ROB variation does not affect much as the base machine itself had a ROB of 64 and thus the coefficient is small. Thus, a 64 wide ROB is sufficient enough for the benchmarks used. Moving on with the conclusion, uh, the objective of our project was to model a superscalar processor on two different simulators like GEMFI and ChamSim and observe the performance of the model by varying its parameters on different benchmarks. We chose IPC as the performance parameter and used it as the target variable in the MLR predictor. The MLR model helps in reducing the simulation time and hence gives a general idea about the impact of varying any particular architectural parameter. We manually analyzed the impact of different architecture parameters and found it similar to the coefficients that were generated by the MLR model. For example, the manual analysis found no significant impact of varying LQ and SQ entries and this was evident with a coefficient value of near zero in all results generated by the MLR. We would like to thank you for listening to our video presentation of our project. If you have any question, please post it on the eCampus. Thank you.